Okay, my name is Josh Block. Uh, welcome to the Hudson Institute. I'm honored to uh, be joined by uh, David Albright and Oli Heinonen, Oli of the Stimson Center and David Albright of the Good ISIS. Uh, these are two of, if not the two uh, foremost experts on uh, nuclear weapons, nuclear weapons development and inspections. And uh, we, this is the, I think the sixth perhaps in our series now of conversations where we are really, as far as I can tell gentlemen, the only the only, if, if one of, if not the only place to get ongoing and regular detailed factual insight into uh, the progress of Iran's nuclear program uh, and the ramifications for that uh, for all the other parties involved from the IAEA to uh, the EU three plus three to Israel and regional actors and others. Um, and so it's, a, it's, a, it's an incredibly valuable resource, these conversations. And I'm, I'm so grateful to you the both of you for, for participating and for giving the public access to your thoughts and, and, you, and uh, your opinions, which really uh, are only available in these, in, these, uh, in these sessions or in the rare press conference. So thank you so much for that. Uh, but well, why don't we begin, David, with you. Uh, why don't you paint for us a scenario where we are? Uh, the Iranians, of course, laid out a path that they were gonna follow. Um, it's hard to verify that, I guess, in some ways because we're not inspecting, but. Um, we do have some pretty good sense of where they are and how much they've got, when, what's going on, and where could they be by the end of the year, these sorts of things. What's going on since we last spoke? One of the, one of the uh, kind of pair of developments is that you have less International Atomic Energy Agency inspections and, and in a sense, eyes on the situation. Um, and you have Iran moving forward with increasing its nuclear capabilities and, and particularly increasing its stocks of 20% enriched uranium and 60% enriched uranium. Now, back in September, we had, my institute estimated that Iran could, be, uh, could break out and produce about 25 kilograms of weapon grade uranium um, in, a, in as little as one month. I mean, it could be longer, of course, but it could be as little as one month. And it could potentially test a nuclear device um, after six months. Um, and so the situation since then has deteriorated. You have Iran has boosted the amount of 60% and the amount of 20%. Um, because Iran is, is making 60% using the 5% stock, um, of enriched uranium, its 20% stock does continue to increase. And, and now they've reached the point, uh, based on Iranian statements about these stocks, that they no longer in a breakout need to use any 5% enriched uranium. All they'd have to do is take the 60%, which is 99% of the weight of weapon grade uranium and enrich it. it, could be done in a week or so. And then they could also take the 20% stock and, and enrich it up maybe even go through two steps, go to 60 and then 90, or just go from 20 to 90. And within a week or 10 days could have enough weapon grade uranium to, to finish getting to the point of having 25 kilograms. First part comes from the 60%, um, and it could be 10, kil almost eight, nine kilograms uh, coming of weapon grade uranium coming from the 60% and then the rest comes from the 20%. So, so this is the first time they've ever reached this point where and, in a breakout, we wouldn't have to use the 5% enriched uranium. And they could do it out of view. Right? Well, well if this, they would need, particularly with the 20%, they would need to use the cascades at the fuel enrichment plant and possibly at the um, Ford Out plant. And that would be under IA inspection. So they, we would know they, about the breakout. What we may not know because of reduced visibility or reduced inspections is the preparation to do it. I mean, they do need some time. We always estimate in a worst case, they need about two weeks to shift over to the production of weapon grade uranium. But that, that the visibility on that could be lessened um, in the, in the coming months. And also we have no idea what they're doing on weaponization. That well, given the fact that they all, they were ready with weaponization, it seemed in, in, in 2003 and four, all they needed was the fuel to test those bombs at the Imad program. Uh, I doubt that that 
expertise has gone away. Uh, but just back to your point about uh, the test, they, they, if, if they're uh, able to uh, achieve a, a 60% enrichment, uh, it, it's 99% of the way there, and they can use uh, one of the newer centrifuges, not just the old IR ones, but some of the IR sixes or others that they've been building in, in, in somewhat in secret, uh, out of view of the uh, inspection regime. Uh, if they were to bring one of those in out of view of the cameras, some of which apparently are, were destroyed or not working, uh, could they set that up in a place and then be able to, to, to accelerate that enrichment uh, process in a way that's you know, fit faster well, and... Yeah, and, and Alice should weigh in on this too. I mean, I think they could set up a cascade or two to take the 60% up to 90. Now, once they took the 60%, that's under safeguards that would be detected. So I still think we're in an era where, um, in terms of the breakout discussion, we're, we're, it's in an era where the IA would trigger an alarm, but would there be enough time to do something before they reached their first significant quantity or what we estimate is 25 kilograms of weapon grade uranium? I'm not so sure. I, the, when the when the when the G20 met last week in uh, in Europe, the European powers of the United States put out a statement uh, that it that was that focused on Iran. It didn't include Russia or China or others who were at the meeting, but it did say that the United States and its allies were committed to preventing Iran from developing or producing a nuclear weapon. What does that language mean to you? And what well, do you believe it to them? Yeah, you, you can prevent with all means which you have. And the question is which means you have and how much you know about the Iranian nuclear program as of today, where they are, what they are doing, which might be their bottlenecks, which other problems they might have already solved, et cetera. So we have to remember that the intelligence is never, you know, entirely up to date and there are unknown, a lot of unknowns. And as David pointed out, what we see here is also that these capabilities which Iran now has new capabilities which were not there in 2015 are based on these more advanced centrifuges. And in the current situation, actually the IAEA has lost a little bit control on those more advanced centrifuges for two reasons. IAEA is not allowed to monitor anymore assembling of those more advanced centrifuges and also the stock of those which have been manufactured before are not on the IAEA control. And then this leads to a situation when Iran doesn't at the same time apply the additional protocol and early provision of design information that they can set to some corner, even in Natanz, a few cascades. Remember, we are talking very small amount of cascades here. Those which has produced that 10 kilos of uh, uh, 60 percent of this uranium since September. It's just two cascades, 150, 160 machines. Put that five times more, put 10 cascades there to some corner where you don't let the IAEA go and be ready and then you can come very quickly. So these are the prices we, we pay and this is what Mr. Grossi means when he talks that the IAEA is uh, flying blind. There are many other things where the IA is also blind, but this is one of, I think, at his major concerns. Yeah, and let me, let me just emphasize, I mean, they, we are now at a point where the kind of things that drag on the breakout estimates have gone away, that Iran now has enough 20% and 60% to go right to weapon grade uranium and, and that allows it to go much faster than if it, it, even from three to six months ago, when it's still, you know, it could enrich the 20% to 90, but it then had to then use some of the 5% to go to 90 and, and go back six months, it would have had to use natural uranium to finish out getting enough for a bomb. So we're, we've in a sense crossed a threshold. Um, and what Ali said is unfortunately, I something I agree with is, is that as Iran builds up its stock of 60% enriched uranium, and, and it's roughly five kilograms per month, just as they've, they've demonstrated in the last couple of months, um, they'll, within several months, reach a point where they'll have enough 60% to, 
that in just a few cascades within a short amount of time, they could have enough weapon grade uranium per bomb. And, and also at some point, they'll have enough 60% to use directly in a nuclear explosive. 60% combined with Iran's knowledge about making nuclear weapons could right, it's sufficient as a nuclear explosive. Yeah, it's sufficient. So uh, you know, it seems to me what I'm hearing from you guys and, and observing is that we're at an intersection uh, you know, of these two uh, factors. One is that Iran's it, under the Obama administration, you know, this progress, this rapid progress by Iran seems to have taken place in the last year, really, since the election, uh, where they've made such dramatic uh, progress. Whereas under the previous, you know, under the pressure from the from the previous administration, they weren't racing ahead as quickly, um, and they were releasing some of these prisoners that they had. At the moment, that the, the opposite seems to be happening, even though the U.S. and the world have been engaged in negotiations with them. That to me seems to be a product of Iran's strategy, which is to delay, delay, and drag out the negotiations, while and avoid pressure, while it can, while it to, can use to achieve the things along the two tracks you're describing. So on one hand, they are closer and closer to uh, David the 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 quantities of material that they would need uh, and the quick to quickly up and rich and skipping stages sixty to ninety and ninety nine percent there, with a lot with a lot of material. And only at the same time, they're managing to shrink dramatically the window that the international community and the IAEA has on their activities, particularly those uh, with the advanced centrifuges and things that are outside of the traditional um, uh, original uh, NPT, but may fall under the, the JCPOA and some of these other things, some which may have been badly written, you can, you know, so given loopholes. But, whatever is going on, they're rapidly advancing the program to places that it has never been out of the view of the international community. How long can that, and my question is, how long can that last? And did I only describe the circumstance somewhat accurately? Well, this is a risk assessment. This is really a risk assessment where you look what are your knowns and what are your unknowns and unknown unknowns. And it's, a, it's not just the numbers, but it's the intelligence information, other uh, interpretations of the Iranian statements. On the other hand, we can see that, uh, particularly in the nuclear domain, intelligence has been able to intervene there and knows a lot of things which happen in the nuclear arena in Iran when we see all these sabotage, which hits probably fairly uh, sensitive points. But on the other hand, you know, the, uh, it's not so clear what they have done, for example, with the weaponization. You mentioned nuclear test uh, preparations. We have to remember that the Midan project was very far in uh, completion. They were ready to do certain tests and uh, they drilled the holes. They made test explosions using, you know, conventional explosives. They de developed methodology. They even developed equipment, which is shown on those reports, which we have written with David. So this area really, I think, needs a more attention from the international community and not to leave it only to those uh, five states, because if you want to have a pressure on Iran, it has to come from the international community, not certainly these five countries can be the conveyors, but we need a very different approach. And now we are approaching that if the negotiations get going by the end of the month. And the key question is that, is it now then time to be more forceful in the IAEA Board of Governors? Should it send a strong message to Iran like it did in uh, 2005? that, you know, if this and this doesn't happen, you know, this will be consequences, which is in this case, the referral of the case to the UN Security Council. And let's assume that it goes to the Security Council. We have to remember that the JCPOA is still existing. So France, Germany, Russia, China, UK, they can invoke the position of snapback snap sanctions if they so decide. So it is also test now 
for these others that how serious they are with the Iran. And I see also the credibility of the whole verification regime being questioned in Iran and also the whole NPT regime. Because if Iran maintains, and I think it's going to maintain some of these enrichment capabilities, we will meet for in the next few years a similar situation with one exception. Iran would be much more advanced technically. So if we let this one to slip away without proper action, we will face problem in the future. And then certainly some other countries may follow the same scheme. One of the things that is striking about this policy in general, the one that has been pursued since the Obama team took over, where, uh, where prior to that, the, the goal was to get Iran to agree to uh, give up some element of the nuclear fuel cycle uh, so that it would uh, be agreed to be part of an importation of nuclear fuel uh, process, which still seems to me to be the right, the right outcome ultimately, unless to, only to your point, we want to dramatically undermine the global and the ins nuclear inspection regime and encourage uh, all the countries that have already signed uh, one, two, three other nuclear cooperation agreements that pledge not to pursue uh, fuel cycle and nuclear enrichment um, uh, to, to break away from those agreements, then we'll have just a massive proliferation of nuclear, uh, you know, this is a big mistake, it seems to me, and we have time to rectify it. David, as you look at the conversation, so the Iranians say they wanna come back to talk on Thanksgiving or thereabout, is that right? Yeah, after, and interestingly, after the Board of Governors meeting, so they're trying to use the date of resuming talks to undermine the motivation of the Europeans to put forth a resolution that would condemn Iran for its blatant violations of, of its safeguards agreement. The, the thing's so always talking about, the weaponization yeah. part, the, the undeclared uranium found at, at former nuclear weapon sites, um, and, and trying to get to this question of, you know, does the pro nuclear weaponization program continue today? And so Iran is timing the start of the negotiations to buy some more time, avoid some, some criticism. And I think it, it's a mistake uh, for the for us to accept, to accept that. that. Can you, can you, by the way, David, very, it's a great, great example of the, of this, of the way the tactics Iran uses to achieve these long strategic delays during which it strengthens its nuclear position, again, as strength with the West. Can you think of other examples of that in the last handful of months uh, that the Iranians have used to delay the, uh, the resumption of either negotiations between the two sides or pressure from uh, the, the, the Board of Governors? I believe it was last November uh, that the board first considered a conditional resolution that would have referred if something didn't happen. Is that right? And that got pushed. Yeah, no, no, and, and all I can yeah. you probably remember this better than me, but I mean, they the whole the whole strategy of the West has been, um, if Iran agrees to talk or negotiate, they get rewarded with delays in in the resolution. It's been going on for several years, and it's and it's uh, been implicit in how the JCPOA was negotiated and how it's been implemented and, and, and how it's now being renewed. And it's, it's very counterproductive. I mean, I think- Ollie, if, From a policy perspective, Ollie, do you believe that the, that, the, um, that the, the sanctions should be used in effort to, uh, to get the Iranians to the table or they need to be used to get the Iranians to make a choice about whether they want to keep elements of their program or rejoin the international community in good standing. Yeah, I think that I would use the sanctions somewhat different. Yes, sure, to get them to the table. But I would offer sanctions relief in such a way that the Iranian citizens and the people see advantage out of that. So this is not the sanctioning discussion between the government and the other parties but make it present it in such a way that the people of Iran want to have a change. And they will ask, at, do we actually need this uranium enrichment at this point of time? Because there are something else which is offered to us, like uh, bread and butter. So I think, you know, this is the way this should have been set up, but unfortunately not. 
do you think it would be useful to make that clear while imposing the sanctions until Iran made uh, better decisions than it's making now? Under the Trump administration, they were applying great pressure. The Obama administration relieved a lot of that pressure, and then Iran began to accelerate its program and make worse and worse decisions. What could bring Iran back to back to heel, so to speak? What could what could get them to evacuate some of the 60% material, or uh, you know, get back to a place where you know there's more more time and more more room for discussion? Yeah, I think. Yeah, go two ahead. Type, yeah, two types of pressures: international community on one hand. Uh, uh, IAEA, UN sanctions impact on their economy from that side. And from the other side, the other pressure, which are the people of Iran telling to their own government that we want a change here. Now, let, let me just add, I mean, if, if I, I don't know, flew in from Mars and looked at this situation, um, I would, I would look at what Iran's doing with its 60% and 20% and just say, Iran is breaking out. It's not a quick one, it's a slow, slow breakout. And I would wanna know a lot about what Iran is knowing and developing on nuclear weaponization. And, and that's missing now. I mean, the IA wants to do that, wants to know about the weaponization activities that are, that are existing today and may be accelerating as far as we know. Um, and and the, I think the, the discussions on the JCPOA, the way they've been structured and Ali discussed, moves us away from learning the critical thing we have to know is, is that how close is Iran to building nuclear weapons? Is it preparing to do that now? As it, as is, it's making 60% enriched uranium. It has no need for that at all. And, and so what are they doing on the weaponization side and the key to that is, I think, is through the IAEA and, and pressure that the IAEA, if it gets support from the Board of Governors, can, can actually start to put on her mind. So, uh, David, on this point, I think one of the most important reference documents that I have come across, and I produced one based on the research in your book, is a list of the facilities that need to be inspected where we now know the Iran has been conducting the very work you're describing. Uh, it's a, there's, a, there's a version of this memo available on the Hudson Institute website, uh, on my Josh blog page. And on, on your ISIS website, I believe there are memos that include similar information that, are, that is out of your book. And I would commend everyone to go look at these things. The point I'm making here is there are, um, of the nine facilities that the, the people uh, didn't have specifics about, often didn't know about, um, before the discovery of the archive that came out of Iran, uh, three of those sites are the places where there's uh, is this unexplained enriched uranium, including the test sites we were discussing earlier, um, and uh, and they've 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 not really been inspected. They've it, we just it's it's not happened. There are another six sites along with those that are also significant, that you know had had and may have ongoing work taking place there, uranium metal building things that have to do with weaponization. And in addition to that, there are, I believe, another 12 uh, or so sites that, that are noted here, including the names. The names are often omitted from the IEA reports, but the names are here along with what their status is and what the inspection status is and their priority for inspection. Why is it, Ollie, that these places, which is really seems to be where a lot of this illicit hidden military work has been done, may still be doing, is stored, is, so, is out of reach for the, for, the, for, the, uh, for the IEA at the moment. What's going on? Well, I think that what we see here was a great bargain done in 2015, where the people believe that if we don't touch this weaponization and we monitor production of fissile material in Iran, everything will be okay, and Iran will not build the nuclear weapons. This was their thinking, and this then caused this agreement, which is kind of a bit fussy, where the IAEA made some questions on possible military dimension, got some answers, was unsatisfied with the answers, but the board still endorsed the uh, so, JPP so way and the answer. Based on that, their belief that that would be a good way to go ahead, was it a good way or did it not, what did it work or did it not work? 
uh, most likely it did not work because we are now in a very different situation and there's more emphasis as Pe David pointed out on this uh, Laguna where they are with the nuclear weaponization. And I want also to bring attention one thing which gets forgotten about the discussion. Some Russian diplomats say, oh, that's, that's the past. Well, past is always important in the history to start with. But actually, if you take the comprehensive safeguards agreement, and let's take as just as an example, this Marivan uh, nuclear weapon test site, which was under construction. Since there was supposed to be nuclear material, a nuclear weapon, this was actually subject to the IAEA safeguards agreement. It should not be because it's a non-peaceful installation, but that's the fact. So this is a grave violation of uh, safeguards undertaking. Even if you didn't yet bring nuclear material there, but the fact that you decide it to handle, you had the equipment, that meant that it was subject to safeguards, early provision of design information, nothing to do with the uh, uh, additional protocol. This is a proved, simple safeguards issue. And those lists which you mentioned, same is valid for Turku Sabad, pilot uranium conversion facility, parsing Dalekan to the uh, place which was not visited by IAEA at all in 2015, or Project Midan, I mentioned. And then Sahid Puzorni, which is the place which was under construction in, in Partsin. It was designed to build and fabricate nuclear weapons components. Nuclear weapons components are made from fissile material. Fissile material is subject to the IAEA safeguards and under provision of the safeguards agreement, as soon as they started to construct it, it fell under the uh, IAEA safeguards. And I point one more thing from 1990s when the additional protocol uh, was uh, negotiated and strengthening of IAEA safeguards. There was a decision by the Board of Governors that any nuclear facility which has been built, but never operated or never had uh, nuclear material was still under the safeguards. And IAEA had a right to verify if it had been dismantled or not. That was strengthening of safeguards in mid 1990s. Why did it was done? Because not only because what we saw in Iraq, but what we saw in uh, South Africa or some other places. Those lessons have been forgotten and they should now be taken up and a little bit brushed from the dust and get the P5 plus one to support them. David, what's your, what is your take on the, I mean, the, what, Oli, what Oli just described is really dr dramatic. I mean, I think it's underplayed and not well understood sufficiently by uh, even members of Congress and other policymakers. There is a huge uh, gap in our visibility there because we have not pursued trying to understand what's, what they have and where it is and what they've got. Uh, and since we now know that the last JCPOA didn't, didn't solve our problems, what do we need to do to, uh, to get to a place where we can uh, get in there, create, create the conversation, the pressure, a necessary support the board of governors to uh, to you know to at least make the the, the global community the, the the EU three plus three focus on uh, getting to these places. How can there be a deal without it? Well, I think the the weaponization and, and the urgency of understanding the the weaponization part of this um, is more and more evident. But it but also the process of dealing with it offers great opportunities. Um, the IA lives in a world that is accepted, um, well, I'll just say it this way, it lives in the international community and is a very credible um, international organization. And when it says countries are violating their safeguards agreements, countries listen. And so I think 
working that side of this offers a great opportunity to, to dramatically increase the pressure on Iran um, and, and get to a, the probably, I would say, the most important question to settle um, at this point in time is to figure out, um, does Iran have a nuclear weapons program today? And how close is it if it had enough weapon grade uranium to be able to conduct a nuclear explosive test? And at the same time, try to figure out how close it could be to delivering a nuclear weapon on a ballistic missile. But I would say the former is, is the critical thing to understand because if Iran tests a nuclear explosive, as we've learned in India, case of India, Pakistan, North Korea, those regions, the region of the Middle, Middle East will change fundamentally. And it will be very difficult to walk this problem back and stop proliferation. I don't know if you can see on my, on my screen the memo. I'm trying to do that. Can you, Oli? Yes, I can see, yeah. So uh, here you know, uh, are some of the places that we're talking about. The Iranians continue to build advanced centrifuges, uh, you're, as you're talking about, and they're doing that out of the view of, uh, uh, of the West. They've been making uranium metal. That's another thing that happened in some of these places. Um, do you, you mentioned a project Maidan. Um, this was one of the test, the test places. You know, Sarah, in a previous discussion, went through a detailed um, uh, presentation of what took place there. But David, do you just want to touch on how serious these things are, like what happened there and in other test sites? Well, Iran had a crash nuclear weapons program in the early 2000s. So it was building um, a whole series of facilities to be able to make weapon grade uranium, turn it into weapons components. And Ali mentioned Shahid Borjardi. It had a pilot facility, um, Shahid, Shahid Malalati, that was also unknown until the archive uh, to develop at, uh, the making of these weapon grade uranium components, but also to be able to make, make one or two um, uh, components uh, sufficient for the, the, let's say the first bomb. And, um, and so you, the Project Madan was another part of this project so they could be able to test one of these devices in an underground explosion, mostly for political reasons. Although if they did it, they would learn more about making nuclear weapons, as we've seen in the case of North Korea. And so, and then let me just add. And so, the uh, with such a large program, um, you they would not only be able to make what they viewed as their initial goal of five, but then to make many more after that. And so it was, it's a large program and it went very far toward, toward being able to actually build those nuclear weapons. And we, and we think, and you say at the time that they were ready to cold test one, that meant it was ready to, it was assembled and ready to go, right? They just need to put the-, the, the well, their, their real bottleneck was weapon grade uranium at the time. Right. They just didn't yeah. have, have enough, but they, the cold tests would have been testing the device um, absent that weapon grade uranium. And, and if they did that successfully, um, that's enough to certify that the nuclear explosive would work. That's how Pakistan did it. I assume North Korea did the same. Iraq was planning to do it. And so the idea is sculpt a program that you end with a cold test and that tells you your device will work um, even if it doesn't have the weapon grade uranium in it. Um, and that, but it's a very important milestone. I, I, and I should add, Taiwan did it too. They did a cold test. We don't know at the end of the program in the documentation, the cold test hadn't been done, but it looked like they intended to do it after the Ahmad plan uh, was formally closed. And that brings us back to Maravan. Um, that's where they were going to do this cold test. And the documentation on Maravan shows they were preparing to do the cold test. One of the questions that the IE needs to find an answer to, did they do that cold test after 2003? And, uh, and in some of these, we, it reminds me of the conversations we've, we've been having about um, how well we're keeping track of their uh, uranium hexafluoride. Uh, it seems to me that we used to have a very precise way to measure how much a UF6, and UF6 is 
enriched, uh, you know, highly enriched uranium hexafluoride um, that uh, can then be, you know, further enriched through cascades. Is that right? Yes. Yes. And so knowing how much of this highly enriched material they have or is, is the feedstock was a useful tool to gauging where they were. Only why at the moment do we not have clarity on, on this on this, the material and the amount they have? Well, first of all, I think that the IAEA is a little bit muted because it's not allowed to put the numbers there. And then also these restrictions now imposed by Iran for running and reviewing the surveillance records put another other constraint. And as you see from the IAEA reports, which have been out there, the IAEA started to use word estimates in its numbers when in the past uh, they gave exact numbers, how it was verified. And this goes against practically every principle of uh, safeguards. Look, there are enrichment plants in Germany, there are in UK, UK in France, in Japan, Brazil, Argentina. IAEA has a very rigorous uh, inspection regime there. Timeliness for uh, detection of divers and at enrichment plant is one month. So once a month, IAEA concludes at each of these facilities, is there any indication of divers and or not? But it's not a, a, able to do that in Iran currently. I think that this is a, something which the Board of Governors should really think carefully. And Oli, just to, to sharpen that point, they're not able to do that at the declared facilities. Yeah, that's true. And, and we and we believe that there are some there's an unknown undeclared conversion facilities that may be operating. That should also have been have been inventoried before the last deal, and may still be operating in an unknown place and have never been visited. Is that correct? Yes, uh, actually, the IAEA got. Uh, IAEA starts to confirm the absence of undeclared nuclear and material and activities was confirmed by the JCPOA, that was 2015. So now four, five years, six years has passed and IAEA has not been able to complete that job. Why? One of the reasons is that Iran is not providing access. IAEA sees those uranium particles which are indication of undeclared activity but cannot go to those places where they have been taken because they have been dismantled or to see the equipment where it came from and get an operational history of those facilities which produce those materials. So well, it's, it's Iran it's is not permitting IAEA to do its job, which is required on one hand under the Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement, which is a must for everyone. And also those extra using those extra measures mentioned in JCPOA. Do you think there's a role for Congress or other legislative bodies to uh, you know, stipulate that should there be further agreements like this, it would be, uh, it would require Iran to have completed its full transparency and full accounting and full reporting to the IAEA about the extent of its program and that, that, that be verified uh, or the sanctions could, could go back into place? I mean, what we let them skip these this question of PMD and disclosure and transparency before, and obviously it's a huge mistake. What what do you think we need to do now? How can it be described? And this is what should be, David, in such a way that it that it predicates. You know, Iran wants long term commitments, and well, it should be a treaty then. Send it to send it to the Senate. But what 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 do you think? How can we work these pieces in to achieve the things that we want? Well, if 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 Iran. Right now, there's the IA has the tools. The members of the Board of Governors lack the political will to support the IA to do the right thing. And, and it's a failure of leadership and, of, and, of, and a moral failure. I mean, it's important to know if countries have nuclear weapons program, countries like Iran that have been cheaters historically. And, and, and so I think that's, and, and there's a clear path forward on that. Congress can help by just saying, passing resolutions saying that this is a critical um, critical goal to achieve, establishing that Iran does not have undeclared nuclear facilities and it has a truly peaceful program. If the JCPOA is brought back, um, I think that it won't be a treaty. It, 
it'll have no lasting um, value, I think. I mean, with the sunsets, it, it, it's, it, it's just a temporary agreement at best. And, and I think Congress should resurrect the, the legislation that was being drafted by Senator Corker and Cotton um, that would impose conditions um, on this deal. That, that the Congress could pass, including that legislation, that if at year 10 uh, of the deal, which would be 2025, if the IA has not certify the program as peaceful, certify there's no undeclared activities, and clearly you'd have to deal with this undeclared uranium, U.S. San sanctions would snap back. Yeah, I, don't you think though, don't you think, David, though, that, in or, that, that, that some, of this, some of this transparency and ending the lying and charades and opening their, the additional archives they have needs and, and making people available for interview needs to be a prerequisite to any long-term deal with the Iranians because it, without it, they maintain all the expertise, all the people are employed at just, you know, at places they call something else. All the sites here on this, on this list and that you write about in the book uh, remain open and, and potentially active and accessible to the Iranians to do all this work. Why is it, why is it tenable to, to proceed with a, uh, with a rebooted JCPOA or JCPOA, JCPOA light in the absence of access to these places, and with such an agreement, the Iranians will deny access to any place but the, to those that they have narrowly agreed to, and they'll continue to narrow that going forward. How, well, what the, logic is there? Yeah, and the JCPOA does have a credibility problem. I mean, look how fast Iran reconstituted its program and, and, and then started to expand it. It's only been, it's even been two years since they really um, started to violate the, the nuclear sanctions. And, and what Iran has done so far is just a fraction of what it would be doing in, in 2030 when all the nuclear limitations end. I mean, they'd have many more advanced centrifuges and, and can enrich to whatever level they want. But even if they don't enrich to 60%, they'd have so many advanced centrifuges being deployed, they could they could get to break out timelines of days just by using 5% and a little bit of 20%. So, so I think the future is a lot grimmer than today. And, and if we still don't know what kind of nuclear weaponization activities they've done and conducted and, have, and that are ongoing, the situation will be much, much dire. Um, in the future than it is today. And so today is the time to act. And let me amend what I said. I would put the trigger on full compliance with the IA at year eight of the deal in 2023. I mean, it, there's a, that's a critical date in the JCPOA chronology that, that Congress has to remove all the rest of the US sanctions on Iran. And Iran has to ratify the additional protocols, all it has to do. and. But Congress is going to be expected to act in 2023. I would have an amendment that just says sanctions will actually snap back. They won't be removed if Iran has not fully addressed the IEA's concerns as we know them today. You know, I have to make sure that the IEA doesn't try to undercut this as because the IEA joined this kind of conspiracy of, of uh, a conspiracy to mislead the public about what was actually known at the end of 2015 and what had been accomplished. So that has to also be prevented in this legislation, but that's very doable based on what we know today. I think that the Congress should make a kind of legislation which obliges the administration to certify once a year Iran's compliance with its safeguards undertakings under the Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement, as reported by the IAEA. And if Iran doesn't com uh, comply, the government has to justify why they accept this. And then similar clause for JCPOA, which is an add-on thing. We have to remember it's a kind of add-on thing and different in nature. And then maybe the third thing to be done, and this goes back to this grand bargain. 
maybe one should also disclose the site deals. We saw some of them uh, when administration changed here in the US. So P5 plus one wrote a memo to the IAEA, which was distributed to member states, which gave certain definitions, you know, what is uh, nuclear material which is su subject to monitoring. For example, scrap was not that, even though it was enriched scrap. Yeah, just so, one second there, Oli. This what, sort what, of provision should be there clearly. What we, found, actually, what we found in those deals for the layman was that they agreed to several substantial hidden or non-public uh, agreements that allowed the Iranians to accumulate uh, enriched materials in various forms well beyond the public limits as had been stated under the agreement. And such material they promised would never be reconverted into usable uh, uh, stuff. It would be gone for good. Um, and um, in fact, actually, those materials have been reconverted into enriched uranium despite those assurances in that first deal. Am I wrong about that? Well, we don't know, have not seen big amounts, you know, being converted back. But, you know, the fact is that, you know, not even, not even industry, I, I have been doing this business more than 30 years. You don't flush, uh, you know, scrap out just like that. One day you need to take it out and either solidify it for a long term storage or recover it and take some use of that. That's going to happen at one day. So yeah, yeah. I think that it would be important in a transparent way to account also those materials. But yeah, more let me just add that, is the compliance. Yeah. Let me just add the 20% material that was exempted from the deal, the scrap, was processed already several months ago. Iran did take it out and process it and is using that recovered material today. So well, at all 20%. The 20%, yeah, and, and which I was told, left. yeah, and, and my organization had to reveal that, that those set of exemptions, we, we didn't get the whole story, of course, but we had to reveal those exemptions um, publicly. And, and I think that, in, in, at least to me, signified, given the, the harsh reaction we got, um, that, that the um, side deals are very significant, and and in the and in terms of um, going forward, I agree with Ollie that there shouldn't be these secret side deals. Another one we found, which again AP found the first indications of it, we then published the whole thing, was Iran's uranium enrichment plan. I mean, right. why was that secret? And it shows that Iran plans to build large numbers of advanced centrifuges starting in 2010. I'm sorry, starting at year 10, so in, in 2025, um, and, and then by 2030, have a very, very large um, installed centrifuge capacity. So again, why are, why are these things secret? And, and I think that it's, it, it undermines the credibility of these deals and certainly is not gathering support for these deals. Just to add, you know, to this scrap and those wastes. Actually, IAEA keeps a certain accountancy for those. So the IAEA has fairly accurate numbers for those, but it's not allowed under current circumstances to publish them unless the Board of Governors requires that. Unanimously? Then the Secretariat has to tell it. There is a provision in the Safe Cars Agreement, and this is also one of the disputes which is today between Iran and some other parties because Iran feels that IAEA discloses too much information, uh, that uh, some of it is Safe Cars Confidential. Yes, it is Safe Cars Confidential, but there is information which board needs for its own independent conclusions, and that should be revealed. And that's why we see certain numbers there. So I think that for all, I, I don't see why not to, for example, to provide a number for uh, scrap which is in so-called retained waste. That's the legal category. And also perhaps measured discards. Those are the ones which have diluted so 
for that is not practical to recover them back. But those will give a good picture, overall picture, and alleviate concerns, perhaps, if they are very small amounts. Well, you know, it, it feels very much like we are approaching, uh, you know, a, a, a 10, 11 months, almost a year of, as Director Grossi has put it, uh, flying blind or flying through thick clouds in, trying, in, in terms of his uh, ability to execute his mandate uh, of understanding what's happening and, and uh, reporting on it and certifying the Iran. Uh, what do you think he means in particular? Well, I think a lot of our discussion sort of has, has, has brought out those things, but you, you know, Grossi, Oli, what, do you, what, what, these are, are, what is the significance of his statements? I think I th he sees that the verification regime is deteriorating. Maybe there are things which he would like to express in the report in the more transparent way. But because of these various constraints, he is not uh, allowed to do. And he feels that uh, with the longer term, there may be something which will question the behavior of IAS secretary at all, him, like hiding information or whatever, if there are such kind of things, we don't know. But I think that his concerns are legitimate. The board should support the director general. I think he's doing a great job. And Iran should now finally invite him after one and a half month to those discussions, even though I can perhaps with a high probability to predict that the uh, outcome will be not very substantial, but it has to be done anyway. And then is the basic question is really that what P5 plus one are going to negotiate with Iran. Is it a return just to pack the old JCPOA? Or is it to modify JCPOA or some, some small step towards a full JCPOA? Or entirely new regime, which makes really taking care of this nuclear weaponization part, because some of these capabilities, instruments, equipment, facilities, and most likely some nuclear material is there, which is a breach on uh, safeguards agreement. And let, let me just add, I mean, going back to the JCPOA is, is harder and harder. I mean, the, the JCPOA, for example, um, according to the US government, gave a 12 month breakout timeline for Iran to get enough material for weapon grade uranium. And, and what that means is that if Iran decided on some day to violate the deal, it would take at least a year for Iran to accumulate 25 kilograms of weapon grade uranium in their enrichment program. Um, one can argue whether that number is accurate, but let's just set that aside. Iran has been building advanced centrifuges and installing them at its three enrichment plants. And it now has almost uh, 2,000 installed, um, which is, about double the number that could have been installed in the breakout um, in 2016, if Iran had gone that path. Over the next several months, Iran has stated very clearly that it, it intends to install almost a thousand more. Now, you go to negotiate a JCPOA. One of the principles of the JCPOA was Iran would not destroy any centrifuges. They would mothball but absolutely none would be destroyed. So what do you do with this, this 2,000 that are already installed? And what about the next 1,000? It could be installed. Some be installed as we're talking. Or manufactured. Um, how, many being, how many David are being manufactured? Well, and, that, and, and that's right. And how many are manufactured that are not installed? I mean, that's, and so you have to, you have to come to terms with that number too. So, but what happens to the 12 month breakout? I mean, when we run the calculations that are rejoin the JCPOA, you get rid of the 60%, the 20%, you bring down the amount of 5% uh, down one to a lower enrichment level, three point, less than 3.67%, you can only have 300 kilograms of that. Um, you then run the breakout estimate with all, with these advanced centrifuges that are mothballed under the, 
JCPOA rules, you're not going to get a breakout time much exceeding six months. And perhaps if they build all 3,000, it'll be less than six months. So you, you don't even get back what was promised. And so by definition, you have a lesser, weaker deal. And is that worth it? I think that's a very important question, especially given that uh, we, we have so little visibility on the rest of the infrastructure that we believe exists in Iran. And we, we, know, we know exists in Iran by their own words, their own documents. Um, and yet we have not been able to, to inspect or see or inventory. So I don't, I, I just don't, I personally, I don't understand how we could enter into an agreement that leaves all these things in their possession, uh, that things that could dramatically increase their, their capabilities overnight, were they to, or rather quickly, if they were to integrate them and do a deal predicated on our assumption of their process and progress and willingness to abide by this thing. Last question here, I, before we go today, and I, you know, we have so, there's so much value in these discussions, and and I'm sure we'll we'll talk again soon. But they, there are the, the Iranians at the moment ha have successfully delayed and delayed and delayed these talks for so long. What is it that you think that the Iranians are trying to achieve here? I think that they want to make the JCPOA. That's one thing. If this is not successful, they will blame the U.S. that it work, worked out. It's not our, you know, fault. We try it to implement truthfully the JCPOA, so we are the victim of that. And I, why I do this interpretation? I just read this morning, you know, statements of Mr. Bagheri. Uh, Connie, who is the deputy de negotiator, he reminded once again that the purpose of these negotiations is to remove the sanctions. Oh, back to the JCPOA, remove the sanctions. JCPOA is not subject to the discussion. This is their starting point, and this is what they keep. And he previous interpretation, he gave him a little bit more. He said that, you know, for Iran to come with the full compliance, they want first to be sure that the sanctions have been lifted, all of them, regardless for which reasons they were put on. And Iran has been able to see that all oil, monetary and other things uh, work properly. Then they will come with, from their side to compliance, which means that until that point of time, it may be that all the centrifuges are running. Running empty or running full? Running, uh, for example, full. And and how long can how long can we abide that kind of thing in the West? What what sort of stockpile becomes too much to leave in Iran under any agreement? Well, I, I think the, the limit of the JCPOA of 300 kilograms of no more than 3.67% enriched uranium is, is a fine limit. What will they do with the 60% they have? Just give it well, up? They have to get rid of it. That has to be blended down to the level below 3.67 or sent out of the country. I mean, and they and can't get it back. Yeah. So shouldn't sending it out of the country, I mean, like, why are we repeating North Korea mistakes? Well, what do you mean by that? Well, I feel like we every time we, we confront a country who's doing the wrong thing, they've got a, this track and that track. And you say, okay, you keep it, put it in a lockbox, you know, or degrade it, dismantle them, put them in the closet. You know, it always fails to me. Well, I think part of the reason it fails is because we haven't settled the question, does this country intend to build nuclear weapons? And so motivation in Iran and North Korea is to preserve their capabilities, agree to limits, but have timelines on those limits or just violate them at the end. That's what North Korea did when it came time to fess up about its nuclear weapons program. It, it can't be found. And so well, I think Iran is doing the same thing. And so if you don't settle this question of the peaceful use, you end up with a series of agreements that may buy you some time 
but ultimately fail. And we know in North Korea that, you know, it's, it's can end pretty badly. And, um, and I think, unfortunately, we may be headed toward that on Iran, and which, which puts tremendous pressure on countries like Israel um, to strike militarily. And, and I think it's incumbent on the United States to come up with a workable strategy focused on finding the answer to this question about is Iran's program peaceful um, and secondarily reestablishing nuclear limits um, in order to avoid war in the Middle East. And by the way, war not just with Israel, but you know the first thing that the Iranians would do would be attack uh, Saudi oil fields that advocate and do what they didn't do last time, which is cause a global oil shock. Uh, you know, uh, moreover, the, the retaliation on their oil fields would destroy would destroy whatever pathetic uh, oil export industry Iran has. The Chinese, I'm sure, would be thrilled with that prospect because then they would go in and, and agree to rebuild the fields and new technology and, and take all the take all the oil. So uh, it's a very it is a it is an interesting dynamic that exists there at the moment. Uh, only you had something like you looked like you wanted to say something. I think that the, we have to learn from the lessons. Huh? We saw how I India went. We saw how Pakistan went. We saw how North Korea got where they are today. In each of the cases, we failed to stop their fissile material production for nuclear weapons. So the key is here, and I think that we need to look something similar to one, two, three agreements, like mm -hmm. what we have in uh, let's say South Korea, who has some aspirations, uh, or what we got with the Emirates, with a certain caveats that at one point or time they can develop those capabilities when they have a justified need. That's the way to go. Any I agree. Leading I, I, tools there will only just buy a little bit more time. I agree. Diana, enough with this JCPOA. I feel like we're, it's, it's just OBE. And looking towards an agreement, as you describe, Oli, that will... Uh, that will, you know, make sure that there's a that they, that they don't need to have access to the complete nuclear fuel cycle. If they want a research cascade of, uh, you know, 134 centimeters, we can put it in a room and and cap and watch it 36 hours a day. Uh, but it doesn't need to be. Uh, they don't need to be enriching their their. They could get it from a consortium. There's no problem about it. And um, and I really that would that would make the world a lot safer. Uh, so I hope that idea carries some 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 weight out there. Uh, in the in the real world, uh, just lastly, uh, the Iranians are uh, are saying they're going to come back to the table on the twenty seventh. What is the over under on that meeting taking place? What, who knows? I mean, I I would imagine the Iranians will come back and and um, there won't be much progress. There's well, they certainly can say if you do something mean to us at the board meeting, we won't come. Well, they that's right. They can say it, but. Pressure works. I mean, we know that a mod plan was reduced in size because of pressure. The JCPOA rep resulted by pressure. So I think it's, um, of course, Iran doesn't like it. Of course, it's going to try to counter it. But but overall, it's it's a, it's been a successful strategy huh? because they need to sell their oil. They need they have a population that can protest difficult, but still can protest. And, and, uh, um, and so I think the probably should be looking at starting to play, put plans in place to start to increase the pressure mm -hmm. um, on Iran. Like we saw with the gasoline uh, hack last week that shut down gas stations all over the country and directed people to send their complaints to the hotline number of the Supreme Leader's office, perhaps. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Oli, any last words of uh, wisdom before we, before we go to next week's events? There's a wisdom which says, don't repair anything which works. JCPO doesn't work. There you go. So why, uh, why repeat uh, the same mistake twice, as they say? Uh, gentlemen, it is invaluable to have your counsel and your insight and your thoughts. Uh, uh, and we are grateful for your time and your, uh, your genius. Thank you for making time this week. Thank you to those of you who've joined us uh, for this event. And uh, we very much look forward to seeing you again uh, in the future. Many thanks again from the Hudson Institute. Thank you.